We concluded last time by talking about hegemony and this notion of outside views versus inside views of cultural of culture and economic exploitation. So today we're going to take an anthropological view of economics. And from this perspective, it's very useful sometimes to have an outsider, an anthropologist, look at this discipline of economics. And so we can combine an outsider's view with an insider's view of what's going on and offer a cultural perspective of the discipline of economics. Now this is going to critique some of the fundamental premises of economics. And let me say from the outset that I find value in the discipline of economics. Some of my best friends are economists, if I could say that. And indeed, after we critique some of the assumptions of, of economic rationality and self-interest, we're going to turn to what I consider to be some of the most exciting work in the social sciences today, which comes from economics, experimental economics and behavioral economics, the sort of economics that has taken a page from anthropology. So let me begin uh, by talking a bit about economics. The term economics itself comes from the Greek roots oikos or household and nomos or law. And so economics really refers, originally referred to the law of the household, managing a household and considering a household as an economic unit. In this sense, it's more of an ethic than a science. How can we take care of everybody in our household? How can we provision our household with what it needs to survive? But, uh, but economics over the years has, has converted into a science in many ways, a social science, but a social science that stresses the scientific part of that equation over the social part of the equation. Now, there's a beauty to mathematical models of the economy. And mathematical models of economics have really taken off since the mid 20th century to, to today and have become the predominant paradigm in economics, mathematically modeling the economy. But we have to recognize the limitations of these models as well. We can appreciate their beauty, we can appreciate the parsimony of the, uh, uh, of the models, but we have to realize their limitations at the same time. So the study of economics, an economist would say, is allocating scarce resources toward unlimited ends. We have unlimited wants and we only have scarce resources and we have to figure out how to allocate those. But economics in some sense has, has moved beyond this even to become an ideology or a, a cultural mindset, a cultural model, a way of looking at the world, which very often seems to be the natural state of things. Free markets are the natural state of things. Unfettered markets uh, are the way things are supposed to be. So we're going to critique these notions of economics. And to do that, let me begin with the distinction that's made by the economic historian Karl Polanyi, who we've talked about before in the class. Polanyi says that we can break up views of economics into two main perspectives. Substantivist economics which we would call cultural economics, a cultural perspective, and formal economics. Now what he calls formal economics is the formal discipline of economics, what gets taught in economics departments and universities around the country. And formal economics, as Polanyi points out and others as, as well have noted, formal economics today is based on two assumptions. The assumption of rationality, that humans are basically rational and tend to act rationally, and an assumption of self-interest, that we act rationally in our own self-interest. And so in the move, what used to be political economy, which would unite Marx and Adam Smith and Keynes and many others, has really moved to econometrics, mathematical modeling of the economy uh, in the latter part of the 20th century. Now, the idea behind self-interest and rationality harkens back to the work of Adam Smith and Smith's notion that when an individual pursues his or her own self-interest, they're simultaneously pursuing the best interest of the society as a whole. And this is the moral justification that Adam Smith in 1776 in his classic Wealth of Nations uh, provided for the discipline. Now Smith, like Marx, is often caricatured in popular perceptions. He wasn't really the radical free trader. He saw a role for government and government intervention in the economy. But at the same time, he pointed to this notion of pursuing one's self-interest works in the self-interest of society as a whole. And uh, let me read a quote from The Wealth of Nations. 
It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard for their own self-interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, not, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Nobody but a beggar chooses to depend chiefly on the benevolence of his fellow citizens. He goes on to say that every individual generally neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own gain, and he is led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. And this is Adam Smith's famous invisible hand. If we all pursue our own individual self-interest, it's going to make the economy work more efficiently and produce more wealth for society as a whole. Now, the assumption of rationality, the assumption that rationality is universal and that there is some sort of universal rationality is obviously very problematic to anthropologists. We show that different cultures have different cultural logics. There are different rationalities at work in different societies around the world. And so an economic assumption of there being a single rationality, a single self-interested rationality is problematic at best. Now, humans are, uh, the, uh, the, the notion that humans are rational and that they act to maximize returns. They act to maximize returns on their investment, their investment of time, their investment of money. They act to, uh, to maximize utility is the way the economists would talk about it. But this is one of those nebulous concepts that encompasses so much, so much cultural stuff that it really becomes useless. Utility is the usefulness of an object to you, or to you, or to you. But that utility is defined by you. So it, 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 a utility of a cup is apparent. The utility of this cup is that it holds my water, or it holds my coffee. The utility of a pen is that I can write with it. But what about the utility of a movie, for example? That's going to vary substantially from person to person and cannot be uh, boiled down to these nice, neat, rational choices. So utility is defined differently uh, between cultures. And this is really what substantivist or cultural economics points out. So formal economics rests on these two pillars, these two assumptions of rationality and self-interest. Substantivist economics, anthropological economics, holds that cultures, that economies are culturally embedded. That, cult, that economies arise from cultures. The particular circumstances of economies differ from society to society. And we cannot have universal rules that apply around the world. Now we could look back to the work of the German sociologist Max Weber who wrote a classic text in 1904, The Protestant Ethic in the Spirit of Capitalism, in which he really captured this notion of substantivist economics. And what he did in The, the Protestant Ethic in the Spirit of Capitalism was compare the prosperous Protestant northern Germany in which capitalism had taken off with the less developed Catholic South of Germany. And he says that the Protestant ethic of saving money, of living austerely, it led to the development of people to save money and the development of capitalism because people had money that they could invest, whereas in the south of Germany, the Catholics were always having festivals and they were spending their money on wine and having a good time and capitalism couldn't develop in that context. And so what, what Weber is arguing is that capitalism emerged from a particular social, religious, cultural context. Now, we can think of a number of counterexamples to the economic assumptions of rationality and self-interest, things that we've talked about in this course uh, so far. The Dobi Juke Wansi, for example. They, they, the idea that there are unlimited wants and that we have to allocate scarce resources to unlimited wants, it doesn't hold up for the Dobi. They don't have unlimited wants. And accumulating lots of stuff, as we discussed, would actually be maladaptive for the, for the Dobi. The Trobrianders, likewise, the Trobrianders spend a great deal of their time trading in yams, and even in these cuvee yams, those huge 10 or 12 foot long yams that can't be eaten because they're too fibrous. Their value is symbolic. 
Or think about the Trobri and Kula trade, where they trade these shell necklaces and armbands. There's very little material utility to these objects. Their utility is symbolic. And so the economies of, of trade are embedded in those particular cultural systems. And so it's important that we take into account not only economic capital, but what Pierre Bourdieu calls symbolic capital, honor, prestige, these social debts that can be built up by loaning someone something, for example, that can then get converted back into real capital, as we discussed in Lecture 16. The anthropologist Marshall Sollins has argued that uh, really what anthropologists need to do is turn economics on its head. He argues that it's a symbolic art logic that organizes demand and not the other way around. And to illustrate this, he turns to the meat trade in the United States. He says, why in the United States do we eat cattle and pigs and not horses and dogs, for example? He says it would make just as much economic sense for us to raise horses for meat. In fact, it would probably be more efficient to raise horses for meat. What do we use horse meat for in the States these days? It's for dog food, cheap dog food. So we could raise horse meat in the United States on the Great Plains incredibly cheaply. But we don't do this because we have a symbolic system that places horses and dogs as being somehow closer to humans. It would be almost cannibalistic to eat a dog. But of course, this is a culturally specific notion. In, other, in, in many Asian cultures around the world, it's perfectly fine to eat a dog. It's, it would be more acceptable to eat a horse because they're not quite as human-like as, as dogs. But nonetheless, that would still be a bit taboo. But even cultures as closely related to us as the French commonly eat horses. And so there is a cultural logic that organizes the economic demand for these products. He also, Solins in the same work, also points out that uh, this notion of distancing what we eat, uh, cows and pigs, from being cannibalistic, from eating humans or dogs or horses. In doing this, we play these linguistic games. So what is cow meat? It's beef. We have this synonym that, that, that removes it from the physicality of eating meat. What do you call horse meat? It's horse meat. But we have separate words. We have pork and beef for, cow, for pigs and, and cattle. But we don't have separate words for dog meat and, uh, and horse meat, for example. He also points out, just as a, another aside here, that if the laws of supply and demand are universal and, and apply in all contexts, then why isn't tongue, for example, cow tongue, more expensive than filet mignon. There, there's much more filet, there are much more steaks on a cow than there is tongue, and yet tongue has been encoded culturally as being a food of poverty. But there's much less of a supply of it, so why aren't prices actually higher for tongue? So we can think of these examples, we can, and I could go on and on with examples of cultural exceptions to these presumed laws of rationality and self-interest. But what I would like to do uh, now is turn to an emergent field in economics, or two interrelated fields in economics, experimental economics and behavioral economics. And this is the work of a group of economists, and among them are John Nash, who won the Nobel Prize, Vernon Smith, Daniel Kahneman, and others who have decided to take a behavioral approach. Let's not construct these abstract models of how people should act if they were acting rationally, how people should act if they were producing their own self-interest. Let's see what people actually do and try and construct our models out of that, a very anthropological approach to the study of economics. Now, experimental economics, uh, one of the classic cases in experimental economics is a hypothetical game called the prisoner's dilemma. And this really raises the question, was Adam Smith right that acting in one's own self-interest always works for the greater good. So was Smith correct? Pursuing your own self-interest uh, also advances the self-interest of the group. Now to answer this question, let's consider this, this prisoner's dilemma. 
So pretend you, let's put yourself in this context. You have to sort of put yourself in this mindset and consider what you would do in this circumstance. So pretend that you're a criminal, first of all. Pretend that you and an accomplice have committed some crime together and that you've both been arrested. But the police don't have enough evidence to convict both of you. So they've arrested you and they've put you in separate interrogation rooms. You've not been able to talk with your accomplice, so you haven't been able to work out a common story. Your interrogator, the police officer, walks in and offers both of you uh, a deal. If you refuse to talk to the police and you know, and you know that they don't have enough e evidence, if you and your accomplice both refuse to talk to the police, you'll be convicted on a lesser charge and serve two years each in prison, let's say. So if you don't talk to the police, if you cooperate with your accomplice and keep your mouth shut, you'll be convicted on a lesser charge and serve two years in prison. If you confess and your accomplice does not confess, so if you turn on your accomplice, if you defect in the language of this game, if you confess and your accomplice does not confess, you will go free and he or she will serve five years in prison. Conversely, if you don't confess and your accomplice confesses, you will serve five years in prison and the other person will go free. And finally, if you both confess, you will each serve four years in prison. So to review this very briefly, if both of you refuse to talk to the police, you'll be convicted of a lesser charge and each serve two years. If you confess and your accomplice does not, you will go free and he or she will serve five years. And if you both confess, you will each serve four years. So what would you do? It's always in an individual's best self-interest to confess. And in the language of this game, that's called defecting because you're not cooperating with your accomplice. It's always in your best interest to defect. And why is that? Well, it's, you're always going to serve less time in prison. Your, the, your accomplice can do one of two things. They can hold out or they can confess. You can do one of those two things as well. If you uh, confess, if you defect, you're going, and the other person does not, you go free and that person serves uh, jail time. If you both confess, then you're going to serve uh, four years in prison versus five years in prison. So the best solution for both, uh, for an individual is always to defect, always to confess, because you're going to serve less time in prison given no matter what the other, your, your accomplice does. However, the best solution for both of you is not to confess, to cooperate with one another. If you both cooperate and hold out, then you're going to serve a total of four years in jail. Whereas any of the other solutions, you would either serve five years or eight years in jail, in total jail time between the two of you. And so collectively, it's better for you to hold out, but individually, self-interestedly, it's always better to confess. So there's this, 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 this disconnect between the two. And what this proves is that sometimes self-interest can work against the common good. And this, this was John Nash's great realization. And this is really, can be used to radically modify Adam Smith's notion of self-interest. Now let's consider another hypothetical situation. This one's called the tragedy of the commons. There's a village that keeps a common pasture. And this common pasture is big enough for every household to keep one, let's say, sheep. Uh, in the pasture without degrading, degradating the, the, the quality of the pasture land. So everybody can keep one sheep on the pasture land and it can be sustained forever. But individuals may think, well, who's going to notice if there's just one extra sheep up there? So I can just put two sheep and nobody will really notice and I get to freeload off of the goodwill of the, the whole village. So I'll just put one extra sheep up there. But then if everybody does this, if everybody thinks this, if everybody pursues their own individual self-interest, the, the pasture land is going to, to, to become uh, degraded and isn't going to be able to support anyone. So uh, pursuing one's own individual self-interest, again, in this sort of situation, can produce a, uh, a common bad rather than a common good, if you will.
Now, my own work uh, in economic anthropology has pursued this line in recent years, and what I've been doing is playing games with people, with Maya peoples in Guatemala. I've also played these games with my students here in the United States uh, and a little bit in Germany. And the game I've been using mostly is the ultimatum game. This is a game that you play with real money, and the notion is to see how people react, if people react rationally when they're playing a game with real money. So let's, again, if you would, put yourself in this circumstance. I'm going to set up this game and think about what you would do. So I'm going to give you, in Guatemala, I play with just a few dollars, but to make it uh, more significant here in the States, let's say $100. In this game, you have two players, player A, and player B. They don't know each other. They don't know who each other uh, are, but they, they know that they're teamed up with another player. You are going to be player A. I go around and I give you $100, $100 in cash. You're player A and you have $100 in cash. You're going to be able to make one move in this game, and your move is you have to offer a percentage of that $100 to player B. You can offer $1, you can offer $20, you can offer $50, you can offer $75, $80, whatever you would like, but you have to offer some percentage of that $100 to the opposite player. That's your one move in the game. I will then take your offer over to player B and I will say, player A has offered X amount, $20, $50, $75, and then player B either accepts that offer or rejects it. If player B accepts the offer, you divide up the money as it's been offered. If player B rejects the offer, all of the money gets returned to the central pot and neither player gets any money at all. So how much would you offer? What percentage of this hundred dollars would you offer to an anonymous player B? The most rational choice is to offer the smallest percentage possible to offer one dollar, for example, because you're going to maximize your returns and if player B is acting rationally, player B will accept one dollar. One dollar is better than nothing, but in fact, and in this game, player B knows how much money uh, that player A has gotten. In fact, when I play this game with uh, my students, in the, my university students, for example, I get a bipolar distribution. I get a lot of people, mostly economics majors, offering one or two dollars, a very small percentage, but then I get another large number of people offering fifty dollars. More people, in fact, offer fifty dollars than any other amount. Now, this would seem irrational. Why would people offer more than fifty dollars? And if I interview these, these participants, they'll say, well, I don't, it, it just seems fair to offer half of it. It's extra money that I'm getting, and I'm afraid the other person would turn down an offer for less than fifty dollars. And in fact, that is the case. People turn down offers of one dollar or two dollars or even ten dollars or sometimes even twenty dollars. Now, why would they do that? It, it doesn't make rational sense. Why turn down $10? You're either going to have $10 or you're not. But it's because it offends their sense of equity, of fairness. Why should the other person get $90 and I'm only going to get $10? i am going to reject that offer and neither one of us, and I'm going to show that person, uh, you know, what, how they should act. So in economic terms, what player B, if player B, let's say, rejects an offer of $10, what they're doing is paying $10 to punish the other person. In economic terms, if you reject an offer, it's called opportunity cost. If you reject $10, it's just like paying $10. So they're willing, player B is willing to pay $10 to punish player A for not being fair. And so these games, they really get at uh, uh, this notion that cultural ideas, cultural models of equality and equity and fairness can trump pure economic rationality uh, in these cases. And interestingly enough, among the, uh, in the U.S., the average offers are about 30, 35 percent. When I played this game with Maya peoples in Guatemala, the average offers were about 51 percent. They're hyper generous offers. 
And the idea is because there's a strict notion of economic equality among the Maya. And when I would interview people, why would you offer more than half, for example? And they would say, well, the other per person probably needs it more than I do, and I just want to uh, help them out. <clears throat> so a very different notion of economic rationality. And this gets at the idea of, or gets at this notion of actual behavior differing significantly from expected behavior. Now let me give you a couple of other examples that come from the field of behavioral economics. Uh, a psychologist by the name, a man by the name of Daniel Kahneman has come up with this idea of bounded rationality. And he says, well, in fact, all of these anomalous cases, yes, that's all true, but we, we do act rationally sometimes. But our rationality is bounded. In certain contexts, we act rationally. In other contexts, we do not. Uh, and this is a very useful notion uh, for understanding economics. Sure, we are all rational. At least we're all rational some of the time. But we're not rational all of the time. Richard Thaler, the economist who has done more than anyone else probably to popularize this field of behavioral economics and has a wonderful collection of essays called The Winner's Curse, looks at a variety of economic anomalies and tries to explain those in terms of cultural conceptions of equality and fairness and a, a number of things. One thing that he calls status quo bias, and this is the idea that people are not very willing to accept extra risks. And to get at this notion, what he did was he offered people two alternatives. And again, this is a hypothetical situation. Put yourself in these circumstances. You've come down with a disease. You've just been diagnosed with this disease. And your doctor says, I have a vaccine that can cure you. And the disease, it, it will, uh, you have a one in 1,000 chance of dying a painless death in two weeks with this disease. A one in 1,000 chance of dying a painless death. But we've got this vaccine. So how much would you be willing to pay for a vaccine that would remove this one in 1,000 chance of dying a painless death in two weeks? So just think about that. How much would that be worth to you? Now, consider an alternate scenario. How much would you be willing to accept to participate in a study in which there was a one in 1,000 chance that you would die a painless death. What would that figure be? For most people, the second uh, figure is several times what the first figure would be. You would have to pay me a whole lot to take on this extra risk. But if I already have the risk, I would only be willing to pay so much to alleviate this risk. Uh, Thaler also points to the, to the importance of proximate knowledge, that we act on knowledge that we've learned recently weighs more heavily in our decision-making process, and that this can cloud our pure rationality. So, for example, after there's a big win in a lottery, lottery ticket sales go up. The pot's going to be smaller, so it's really not rational, but people have it in their minds that I could actually win. Somebody just won, so I'm going to buy a lottery ticket. Or driving more safely after seeing an accident. People tend to drive very carefully in the day, hours, days, and weeks after they've seen a very bad accident. Their chances of getting into an accident themselves is the same as it was before they saw the other accident. But we weigh proximate knowledge, knowledge that we've learned recently, more heavily than we do other sorts of knowledge. So in this way, all of these, these cultural elements, these quirks of behavior, we might call them, play upon our rationality and cloud our rationality. So human beings, when we act economically, sometimes we act rationally. When we buy toilet paper, for example, we probably act very rationally because we go to the grocery store, we can very easily compare all of the different kinds of toilet paper, the qualities of toilet paper, the price of each of those different toilet papers, and make what economists would consider to be a very rational decision. On the other hand, when we buy something really big like a house, we often act irrationally. Oh, what's another quarter percentage point of interest? It's only going to add $25 a month to my mortgage bill or something. And yet, $25 a month for 30 years is a lot of money. 
And so we act irrationally in these contexts where we have less information uh, to, to play on. Likewise, a person might be willing to drive all across town, drive for 45 minutes to save $10 on a clock radio, let's say. And yet that same person might, would not be willing to drive across town to save $10 on a big screen television, for example, because the $10 seems like less in comparison to the sum that's going to be paid. So it's all relative in this sense. How much, this, it's the same $10. If you're going to save $10 on a clock radio, that's the equivalent of saving $10 on a big screen TV. But we don't see it that way because of the, the particular context in which it's set. So what anthropologists have to offer to the study of uh, economics is actually looking at what people do. It's very important to make these models of rational choice, and economists have been very successful at doing that, but just as important are constructing new sorts of models that reflect how people actually live and work in the world. And this is what anthropology has to offer economics, and something that in behavioral and experimental economics they've picked up on in recent years.